This is part of a series of three videos on resilient modulus testing. This video summarizes key information from the other two videos and discusses recent advances in resilient modulus test methods. As such, this video should be of interest to administrators and engineers who are thinking about beginning resilient modulus testing in their labs or who are upgrading their current operations. The other two videos in the series present more in-depth information on resilient modulus test procedures. One focuses on the laboratory startup process and includes a detailed definition of resilient modulus. The other provides an overview of sample preparation and testing. Pavement design has come a long way. In the past several decades, we've seen a steady progression away from empirical design based on assumptions about material characteristics. By the 1940s, engineers had moved to design methods based on static loading data, such as the California bearing ratio test. But even as static methods became widespread, research was showing that testing of materials under repeated dynamic loading would produce more realistic pavement designs. As early as the 1950s, researchers showed that such a design method could be based on resilient modulus, an expression of a material's response to dynamic loading. In recent years, the international pavement design community has agreed upon a mechanistic design process and on resilient modulus as an essential component of that process. For example, the 1993 Ashto Guide for Design of Pavement Structures says, the definitive material property used to characterize roadbed soil for pavement design in this guide is the resilient modulus. Work is currently underway on the 2002 version of the guide. It will encompass a mechanistic design method and in all likelihood will continue to rely on resilient modulus as the primary factor in characterizing materials. We can explain the relevance of resilient modulus to pavement design with this animation. Each axle briefly loads all the materials under it. The loading is referred to as stress. As the vehicle moves, stress is transferred to other areas. In response to the stress, the material exhibits distortion, called strain, and then the material rebounds. But the material never quite regains its original shape. Instead, there is an extremely small, but nonetheless cumulative distortion, leading eventually to pavement distress. In resilient modulus testing, we simulate the stress, and then measure both the change in stress and the recoverable strain. The resulting resilient modulus values become an essential input to the pavement design process. Designers choose the type and thickness of materials to limit subsurface deformation. Currently, many agencies calculate resilient modulus values from deflection testing. But resilient modulus values derived from deflection testing usually require a correction factor. And the best way to derive the correction factor is through laboratory resilient modulus tests. In other words, the laboratory results are a useful complement to the deflection data. As a result of the worldwide agreement on mechanistic pavement design and resilient modulus testing, the energies of many researchers and administrators have been focused on the process of resilient modulus testing. Significant progress has been made in achieving consistency and repeatability in the testing process, especially through FHWA's Long-Term Pavement Performance Program, LTPP. FHWA LTPP researchers have identified major causes of previous lab-to-lab -lab variation and have developed effective controls to minimize that variation and LTPP labs, in cooperation with labs throughout the world, continue to address the remaining issues aggressively. In the process, the personnel at the LTPP labs now stand ready as a problem-solving resource for those new to resilient modulus testing. Other important resources for labs beginning resilient modulus testing are the two major documents developed through LTPP. Publication number RD96176 defines the laboratory startup process and includes criteria for verifying the performance of all equipment and personnel. 
Protocol P46 defines test specimen preparation and the testing process. These resources are allowing those new to resilient modulus to approach testing with confidence. And yet, justifiably, administrators and engineers are concerned about the costs associated with starting resilient modulus testing. Experience has shown that labs can meet the LTPP protocols either by purchasing new equipment or by modifying their existing equipment. But experience also strongly suggests that there are substantial hidden costs associated with modifying existing equipment. Each existing setup tends to exhibit its own unique problems, and the availability of technical support from equipment manufacturers has proven to vary widely. In contrast, all major new equipment manufacturers offer extensive training on the use of their equipment. In general, the most cost-effective results have been obtained by purchasing new equipment. Of course, there are other costs besides those related to equipment. Administrators and engineers must consider the cost of training, the time needed for technicians to become proficient in specimen preparation and testing, and the cost of going through the LTPP startup and quality control process defined in publication RD96176. This last aspect, establishing an ongoing quality control process to assure that the lab is collecting accurate data, has been shown to be the most important control on lab-to-lab -lab variation. The initial startup of the QC process usually requires a week of lab time and an additional two to three days annually. Naturally, all of these additional costs will vary from lab to lab. Through the LTPP program, considerable resources have been brought together to help administrators, engineers, and technicians get into resilient modulus testing. The startup and test procedure documents define requirements and processes. This and the other videos in the series help agencies by introducing lab staff to the testing apparatus and procedures. And the cadre of experienced lab personnel is ready to help solve problems. With these resources, administrators and engineers can now be confident that their labs will achieve excellent results in resilient modulus testing.